Hi everyone, I'm Raif Darazi, and in this video, I'm excited to sit down with our guest, Doreen Mora Maracha, to discuss her work in HIV advocacy, HIV prevention, combating stigma, and U equals U. Doreen Mora Maracha, an exceptional champion from East Africa, is a member of the Education Plus Young Women Leadership Hub and host of Maisha Health Digital. Recognized as one of Africa's top 100 change makers, she advocates against HIV AIDS stigma through her I Am A Beautiful Story initiative. Her impactful work has garnered awards and positions in prestigious organizations like the International AIDS Society and UN Women. Doreen is a leading voice in the fight against HIV AIDS stigma. Doreen, thank you so much for joining. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing well considering I'm running around like crazy lately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to uh, start by asking you a general question that I ask all my guests, which um, is what is your assessment of the current state of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? Um, from a personal opinion, I would say I am 50-50 on how we are doing. Like I'll give a uh, Generally, I will rate, at, uh, rate us at a 50-50, 50% because one, we have treatment now, uh, which we didn't have way back in the past. We now have um, access to better HIV prevention methods. Uh, we also have um, a better response generally, unlike what was there in the past. But the other 50 is the part that uh, disappoints me a little bit because HIV has been with us for the last 40 plus years and we have not managed to normalize the HIV conversation. We have not managed to handle the stigma and we have not changed people's perspective about HIV, which means people don't uptake testing voluntarily, people don't take prevention methods seriously, and people don't start treatment on time, which are things that are now affecting uh, the general uh, global response when it comes to HIV. So until we manage the stigma, we have slightly much, a lot of work to do in our hands. Yeah, and it's it's a big challenge, and it's a different kind of challenge than sure. the, the practical one. So very well said. Um, for those of you at, watching at home or wherever you are, uh, Doreen, we met Last year at the International AIDS Conference, that was the first yeah, time, right? Yeah. I feel like I feel like I've known you for longer, but we really just <laughs> because, met one time. Because we, we, we met, okay, like we, we were following each other online. So I feel that's why we, we have probably, we feel like we've known each other longer. But we physically met last year. Yeah. Well, um, you look, you look gorgeous. Thank Doreen you. Doreen is a fierce <laughs> advocate. I always see your posts online and in, you engage with so many people and it's so powerful, the work that you're doing. I, I try my best. And you're succeeding at it. Yeah. So I would like to get to know you a little bit better okay. on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start by asking when you were first diagnosed. So I was first diagnosed with HIV um, around 23 years ago, but I was born with HIV. So but the official diagnosis was done when I was eight years old. So uh, my parents were what we call a discordant couple where my dad is, was HIV negative until he passed on and my mom is still HIV positive. So uh, they basically just, I was sick. I had the what we call herpes zoster. So I was taken to hospital. They tested everything and they were like, can we test for HIV? And then um, I turned out positive that day and I was there was no treatment, there are no ARVs. So it's more of counseling my parents to accept the incoming death. Uh, so it's the only people born with HIV among my siblings is me and my late brother. So they were counseled, they were told, you have to prepare her, you have to prepare yourselves. You must know that one way or another, you're going to lose her. Uh, and mm. I know the, the doctors that time, I feel like they had a very hard time trying to tell people living with HIV that there's nothing we can do. You know, there's nothing as bad as you've gone to hospital to seek help. And then there is nothing they can do completely. So I was taken home. Uh, I was baptized <laughs> and uh, in preparation 
And then uh, five years later, oh. I started my ARV. So in between, there were so many opportunistic infections. But my parents used to rush me to the hospital. Like every time there's an opportunistic infection, I'd go to hospital. Some, I'd stay away from school for a very long time, two months, three months. And catching up with the rest of the kids was slightly challenging because now I was away for like a whole month. They've learned so much. So in 2005, uh, I finally got started on ARVs. And uh, to me, that was also the time I was told because all along they never told me that I was HIV positive. So that was also the time I was told, Doreen, you're HIV positive and you're going to live with it for the rest of your life and you were born with it and um, you're going to start treatment, special medication called ARVs. And that, at that point, as a 13-year-old, I did not take it as shocking news. I did not take it as, as something so huge. I was like, okay, fine. To me, I was excited because every time we did the hospital visit, my mom would uh, also spoil me. So she'll treat me to chips and chicken and soda. And <laughs> those were the packs. The, there were packs. So I was happy. <laughs> so uh, it hit me practically when I was in high school that I am HIV positive because one, my doctors had told me never tell anyone you're HIV positive. So I was like, okay, that's not a big deal. So I just kept uh, living life. So when I went to high school, because it was a boarding school and it was a shared space, the other kids would see me taking this medication. And our medication back then was so huge. So they would be like, what is this treatment for? Why are you taking medication? Are you sick? How do you feel? So now I have to lie, because I was told to say I have a heart condition. Nobody, nobody stigmatizes you for a heart condition. So it was easy. And I will get the, oh, sorry. So how do you feel? How does your heart feel? So I'm there explaining sim symptoms that I have never experienced because it was an easier way out. So when I finally finished high school, then I realized that this is a question I will probably get a lot for the rest of my life on. Why are you on treatment? What is this medication for? And I had never sat down with myself to even accept that part of I am living with HIV. And this is something I tell people a lot that have you disclosed to yourself that you're HIV positive? Yes, the doctor told you you're HIV positive. But have you ever sat down and said, hey, Doreen, you know you are HIV positive? Like, and those words sink in for you to accept that reality because that is something a lot of people struggle with, that they're HIV positive, but they've never reached a point of having a conversation with themselves. So when I when finally it sank into me, I stopped taking treatment. I started blaming my mom for being HIV positive. And the thing is, I'm the I'm now only it's just me and her in that household taking ARVs. So it was so hectic because my other siblings won't understand when I tell them. I, I don't like taking this medication. So I stopped taking treatment. I sought uh, some herbal medicine that convinced us that we were healed of HIV. And we, for two years, I was not going, like I was the, going to hospital picking my ARVs, but I was not taking them because I did not want to be labeled lost in care. So, when I, the first year I went, uh, my, my viral load started going up and the doctors were like, why, what is happening? And I was there like, I, I don't understand. I, I'm also lost like you guys. Maybe you explain to me. So at this point they were considering taking me to second line medication. And then I realized that if I go to second line and I also fail on second line because I'm off, obviously not taking medication, they will take Can me to third line. Can you explain what second line medication oh, is? Oh, oh. <laughs> so in treatment, we have treatment levels. So the first one where everyone is introduced to is called first line medication. In Kenya, the, uh, from the Kenyan context, the, our first line medication is just one pill. But for people who now, uh, for reasons, for various reasons, if you do not, if the first line medication does not work for you, for example, treatment resistance, um, maybe you your viral load is not getting suppressed on that uh, particular regimen. Regimen is the type of ARV. Uh, for, like, for various reasons, that medication is not working for you. So they take you to another level of treatment, which is now the second line level. So if the second line level also fails, then you are taken to third line medication so the higher you go the more the pills so with second line you can mm. take like either two to three or even four medications uh on third line is another cohort of medication there so it's i don't know whether we have a fourth line but i know in kenya we have up until third line 
So when I realized that my doctors were about to take me to another level of medication, I knew that I was reducing my chances because most people, uh, even when you start treatment, you're told to never leave the first line medication because that is, it's easier. It's an easier dosage and uh, very manageable unlike the others because the others is more treatment and sometimes uh, the, the types of ARVs that are used in the other regimens might not be exactly available in so many like third line has very rare uh, types of ARVs so you're usually told as a patient stay on the first line don't leave first line but unfortunately sometimes it's not you and uh, there's nothing wrong you've done but the treatment just isn't working then they do consider taking a treatment um, resistance uh, test and then now you're taken to another level so for me, they were just assessing from the level of virus, which is the viral load in my body, which was going overboard. And they were wondering what was happening. And I was lying because, again, most people living with HIV going through self-stigma and a lot of denial lie to their, to their doctors. They lie. Like, it's, it's easier because then nobody is going to reprimand you. So I lied to my doctors. And then after that, I stopped going to hospital. So when I stopped going to hospital, they sent a social worker to come look for me. I said I would go back, but I still didn't. Uh, this whole time, I, at the back of my mind, I know that I'm cured of HIV from the herbal medication that I took. So uh, fast forward. So just a question. Where did you um, encounter the herbal medication? It, it was in a neighboring country called Tanzania. Mm. Yeah. And how did you get in contact? So in... 2011 this man came on media on national media and was saying that he cures every disease and so because of the hype given through the media I convinced my mother and we went to his place and there were so many people so many people with different health conditions going there it was a whole queue we spent like one and a half days there just to access the man and the and the concussion that he was serving us and once we took it, he was like, remember, I don't cure anybody, but your faith will. And we had faith. So that is how we ended uh. up where we ended up. Yeah. So two years later, I get pneumonia and uh, my mouth, I just woke up one morning. My mouth was so swollen. I couldn't eat anything. I had a huge fever. I was taken to hospital. So many tests were run. And by this time, my viral load was, I think, at around 120,000 copies. And uh, they were, the doctor just looked at me and was like, why did you stop treatment? And I, at that moment, I didn't know how to tell him I was tired. I was, because nobody prepares you for treatment fatigue. It just hits you. And you stop day one and you stop day two and a week has gone by and you're like, ah. I'm okay. My body feels okay. And before you know it, it's three months, six months, you have never taken treatment. Treatment fatigue is very easy to fall into because nobody explains how tired you get. Like you can't even explain it to a healthcare worker. So I just looked at him and he was like, you know, if you don't take this medication, you're going to die. And I'm like, the thing is at the back of my mind, I know that part, but somehow I just kept going. And three years later, here we are. And so he told me... Um, Question. Mm -hmm. but, sorry to interrupt, but when you say treatment fatigue do you, and, and being tired, do you yeah. mean physically tired or do you mean mentally, psychologically tired? It's, it's more of a mental and psychological thing. It's not a physical thing. It's, it's this okay. laziness you get in you that you feel like if you can just go around through not taking treatment every day, life will just be slightly easier. Like you don't have the burden of remembering that today I have to take treatment and mm. then you take your treatment and then mm. tomorrow it's the same thing. So you, you kind of get tired. And I know some people say that uh, taking treatment every day should be like as normal as brushing teeth, as eating. But I tell them those are things that you don't, you can't compare with taking a pill every day. Taking a pill every day is mentally exhausting. You just, you cannot compare it to brushing your teeth because they're not the same thing. Because I know I'm taking this treatment for a particular reason. <laughs> so it's it's not the same thing. It's not at all. So I, 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 I just got tired. It's more of a psychological mental thing. And uh, again, self-stigma. It was majorly fueled by the self-stigma that... I just don't like this thing of living with HIV. I don't like it at all. 
So um, fast forward, the, the doctor was just there uh, being unreasonable and all that. And to be honest with you, the only reason why I went back to taking treatment at that time was because my body was in pain and I could not eat. So everything I was eating was being blended and then I'll just have to drink it with a straw because nothing could pass. And, and I had very many antibiotics, so I had to eat. And uh, my, my so, so I was just looking and sometimes I make a joke of it. Uh, and I'm, I tell people that sometimes I used to look at my family uh, eating chicken because I love chicken a lot. So I will look at them eating chicken and I'm like, they can't blend chicken for me now. I'm stuck here drinking juice because I, I stopped taking my treatment. So uh, a year later, I started uh, working. I was interning at a particular organization. And so we went to test people. So as we were testing people, the young people we were testing were refusing to come to our tents completely. Like we were there for three days, there are no people. So uh, one of our bosses was like, go to the, it was a, a school setup. So go to the classrooms and get them, talk to them, let them know why they need to be tested. So I would ask them randomly when Wait, was the last time. Sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. I, have one, I have a question before you get into that story. Um, okay. How did you get involved in helping with testing. How did I get involved in? in? In helping with testing. It was part of my job description, basically. Like we had to do outreaches. Yeah. What was your so, job at that time? I don't even know whether I had a job. I was just an intern, so I was doing everything, but it was more of, um, uh, okay, it's a government institution, but it had a wellness section. So I was an intern in the wellness section of it. So it deals with teachers. So teachers who are affected by drug and alcohol abuse, uh, HIV, any long-term illness. So they would come in their counselors in that department. Uh, sometimes we would go to the schools uh, ourselves for the counseling, for the outreaches and all that. And whatever is stressing them in life generally, that, that was their stop. So that is how I ended up there. And were you so, interested in that because of your HIV? Is that what drew you? No. Mm -mm. Let me tell you, my HIV was never a driving force at any point of up until that point. Because up until that point, okay. I wanted to be an air hostess. And I wanted to be an air hostess or a radio presenter. So to me, that it had nothing to do with it. But because I'd gone to school and... Uh, they had, uh, I had studied community development and social work. So I was just doing that because my parents refused to let me become my air hostess, follow my air hostess dream. <laughs> so I just wanted this over okay. and done with, and then I can go back and do what I loved doing, which is being an air hostess. And then I ended up in this, like I, I literally just ended up here. So um, okay, thank you for the context. I'll let you continue your story. <laughs> okay, okay. So I basically, uh, we were testing people, they refused, and you will tell someone when was the last time you got tested, they'll be like, I haven't done anything. Why Why would I get tested? I've not done anything. So um, a few years later, uh, I think, no, 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 actually, like a few months after that uh, particular t um, outreach, my boss called me because she knew I was HIV positive. So she called me and she's like, oh, uh, I would love for you to share your story and for us to use it even for the teachers who come to this department and they're living with HIV and they're struggling with accepting themselves. And I looked at her and I was like, <laughs> it, it's not a bad idea, but I knew I did not want to do it <laughs> because part of the reason why I was hesitant was one, I had been told to never tell anyone I have HIV. Because that is what used to happen when you used to get tested in the past. Second was, um, the first stigma I faced was from my own family members. So at one point, there is a point that my utensils were separated and disinfected after I used them. My clothes were washed in different basins and disinfected. So when I finally added one plus one together, I was like, there is no way I am telling people that I'm living with HIV. So when she said it, I just laughed and I was like, I can, I'll consider it. And I'll think about it. So she told me, go write it down, send it to me. I'll work on it. As I was there like, looking at her and I'm like, there is no way I am doing what she is suggesting that I do. Because once people know, you know, the thing about public disclosure is once you are out, you are out. There is no going back. There is no, it was a, nothing. It's, 
you're just gone so but i saw i sat i took her challenge and sat down and wrote my story on paper because that is something i'd never done and i realized that I, I i wrote it like two or three times and i just couldn't continue so i just threw away the papers and i was like i am not doing this there is no way i am going through with this thing so a few days later i was reading the magazine and um I come across a story of another a doctor. She's doing some work in one of the informal settlements here. And I was like, hmm, I can write to this lady, the editor now. And I wrote to the editor. I literally just typed on the work machine and I told her my story and everything. And she was like, I love your story. So the back of my mind when I was writing this story, I was not writing it to her to come out and tell people publicly that I'm living with HIV. I was more of doing it for, it's like chatting with an anonymous bestie and you don't know them, they don't know you and you're hoping they don't respond. So then she responded. Then I was shocked and I did not know what to do. <laughs> and now I had to call my mom because um, my story has my mom's element in it. And if I have to say it and I have to say her story as well, then it might become problematic, especially if she is uh, she is not in agreement with me doing the story. So I called her and I told her, uh, I ended up, this is how things started. And now uh, this lady wants to interview me. And she was like, okay, fine, just go ahead and do the interview. And I was like, okay, fine. So I did the interview and it was supposed to run on the daily paper, like on the print media. And then they say that we have decided to make it on there to just publish it on the digital space. And that time the digital space was not as huge as it is now. So I knew people were not going to read it. I was like, okay, fine. That is even better than being in some magazine somewhere and the people are reading across the country. I don't want that. And then they shared it on their Facebook page. So Facebook had started becoming big in Kenya. And now people were tagging me. People were saying, these people are spoiling your name. Because up until that moment, I had never lived with HIV publicly on my social media platforms. So I was just another person that people happened to know. And we were just talking to, I was talking to strangers that I don't know. And we were just vibing. And now they're seeing me on a newspaper shared online on facebook and they're like the media the media is wrong for this how dare they sue these people and everybody was tagging me so i panicked and i uninstalled my facebook that day i was like no oh, wow. i deleted my facebook page i was like i can't it was too overwhelming so i had also left my email at the very end of that story and then the emails could not stop coming in. I received over 1,500 emails that day and the whole of that coming week were just emails and emails and emails. And then I was scared because this is a lot. This is so overwhelming. You are now carrying people's stories. People are now disclosing to me and they're telling me it's just you, my doctor and me, who know? And now I felt, I felt like a priest. You know how people go to priests and they confess to them. So I felt like that, like all of these people, all of them telling me I'm HIV positive too. I read this story. Oh my God. It was so overwhelming. So I finally now realized that I had actually publicly told people that I am HIV positive. And also because there is one story that stood out for me where the man, he was a man who was living with HIV and married. And he told me that he has lived with HIV for eight years and had never told his wife that he was HIV positive. And his wife did not know that he was on treatment. So he was just taking, he used to take his medication from the office. So he will take mm. his medication, come back home. So everything looks all right. So he did not know his wife's HIV status, and, but he knew his status and he was taking medication very secretly. Then I realized that the HIV conversation is a conversation we have not held publicly. In my country, in Kenya, way back in the early 2000s, there were so many, there were posters and billboards across the country of a man who is very thin and dying and it was written AIDS kills. So it was written in both English and Swahili. And people still have that picture about people living with HIV. They think they look like that to date. So I realized we have never had that conversation with the general population, for people living with HIV. So once you get diagnosed, it is your story. It is your journey. It is you living with HIV and nobody else knows about it. So 
I started sharing my story on Facebook and telling people I was born with HIV and the stigma was there. But at this point, I had reached that point of fully accepting that I am HIV positive and that people will tell me mean things and people will ask, will, will drag me and do all of those things. But I had to, my mission literally at that point was I have to tell this story so that another person who is struggling and is living in secrecy knows that in as much as they don't know the all almost 39 million people living with HIV globally they know one person and that that is that is comforting enough for them so I kept sharing and sharing my story and to be honest with you where I am right now is not a, I, if you take me back to 2015, I would not have thought that this would be where I am. I still wanted to be an air hostess. I still wanted to, I, I did not know that this is how, this is the path that we were going to go to. In my head, I was still like, no, actually in my first interview, I think I told the interviewer, I want to be an air hostess when I grow up. I want to change time zones. I, that was the dream. But then I realized that in my own small way, uh, through my social media platforms, I was healing people. And just that waking up and telling them you are a beautiful story, it makes sense to somebody. It gets somebody to test for HIV because testing is an issue. And that is because of the stigma, because once I turn positive, then what next? Where do I go? How does my life become after that diagnosis? So. And the other aspect was the treatment fatigue caused by the self-stigma I had. It's because when you are given medication, you're told you're going to take them for the rest of your life. The rest of your life is a very long time. So you'll start imagining, I will be on treatment for 40 years. Especially when you're a 13-year-old girl. Exactly. You are like, no, there is no... So it becomes a burden to you because you're like... The rest of my life is hard. It, I feel like I'm carrying something on my back and it is so heavy and I can't keep going with it. So I, I, I try as much as possible to change people's perspective that stop looking at taking medication for the next five years. Look at today. You took today's dose. That is what matters. Today we have suppressed our virus. Tomorrow is another day. We will think about tomorrow when tomorrow arrives. Because if you start looking at it that 10 years, I will still be taking air risk. 20 years, you will stop taking them today. Because you will feel the, the fatigue, the, your mental health is just going to, to go crazy. How do you think you got to the point where you were able to come to the conclusion, okay, I need to look at it one day at a time? What happened mm -hmm. to get to that point? Actually, it's when I went back to treatment. Because also, even when I went back to treatment, I was still taking medication, skipping, taking, skipping. And then I realized uh, that the thing is, I am making this a big deal because I, I and, and I know that this might not resonate to everyone, but I was like, I have never been HIV negative. So I can't say that I miss a life that I was not taking treatment. That has never been my life. My story has always been, I was I like, literally I started going to hospitals from as young as six months all the way. So even if I, if I start looking behind, I'm, I'm going to fall back. If I look too far ahead, I am also going to fall back. So I have to look at today and I handle today. Whatever today brings, we are handling today like it is. Tomorrow is a different day. I do not want to stress about it because, and the thing is, uh, I usually tell people that you no amount of counseling, no amount of therapy, no amount of people encouraging you will save you from you. Sometimes you have to do the job. Sometimes you just have to be honest with yourself and tell yourself, hey, I'm HIV positive. It is what it is. Let me just take this treatment one day at a time. Because your life, I, a lot of people, uh, especially newly diagnosed, come to me and they're like, can I go back and live a normal life? And I tell them, but what is normal? Because ever since you got diagnosed, you've eaten, you've taken a shower, you've brushed your teeth, you have gone for a walk. So what is normal? You have gone to work. So... The, the term normal, usually a lot of people say it's, there's no normal life with HIV, but what is normal? Because I, the, I do that everything like the, the like people who are living, who are not HIV positive. I do that. Who are, not, uh, who are HIV negative. I do the same things with them. The only difference is I have to take my ARV. 
which is one pill that I take just somewhere I, I, around the day and it does not take an hour. It's let's it's seconds literally. So normal to you is not normal to another person. So if it's can I continue with the life the way it was? Of course you can, because the only thing you have to add now for more convenience for you to be strong and healthy is the ARV. That is literally the only element you have to add into your life. But because of the stigma, we still have not reached a point of that mentality for everyone. There are people who still struggle. There are people who still have those days where you wake up and you feel like, I don't feel like taking my treatment today. I don't feel like going to the clinic today. I actually never knew that somebody would uh, struggle to go to the clinic to pick the ARVs until it happened to me. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it does happen. So it's normal. It's literally like a normal human being thing. So, But it doesn't mean that you are a bad patient because ideally sometimes you'll go to the hospital and they'll be like, yeah, you missed clinic. You're supposed to come yesterday. You've come today. So they don't know that yesterday you woke up and you just really didn't, didn't feel like going to the hospital. They, they don't know that. I know it's supposed to be part of the journey, part of the routine. And the same way I tell people with the ARVs, there are days you will not feel like taking them. There are days. It is practical. It is very normal. You will feel like that. But it does not mean that you stop. Not feeling like doing something does not mean stop doing it. It just means I was supposed to take my medication at one. Can I give myself one more hour to feel, to just get that energy? Because how I will be feeling in the next hour is very different. And then you take your treatment. I know that sometimes, and I speak this because I know a lot of people feel like, oh, Doreen, you are always just awesome and your life is cool and you don't get tired with HIV. Besides, you were born with it. So, you know, you can't, you can't have that self-stigma and whatnot. But no, it's there and it's real. And you 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 will get uh, you will get very tired in the journey of living with HIV. It is long and it is lonely, and you only have to do it by yourself. Unfortunately, but it does not mean. And that... I think also, mm -hmm. I think also that part of the part of that is having a routine because routine takes the emotional aspect out of it. Yeah, true. It's just going about your day, like brushing your teeth. I know it's not the same thing, but once mm -hmm. it's just a part of your day, then mm -hmm. emotion kind of is not as big of a factor. It's not attached to it. <laughs> because No, actually, I get you. Once it's part of your routine, you honestly don't see it as a big deal. You, you, that aspect of a, it being a big deal, just it just kind of goes away. And people, uh, a lot of things that worry most people is the aspect of other people. How, what will other people say? How will they think? Will I be able to date? Will I be able to marry? Can I tell my sexual partner that this has happened to me? And I do tell people that until you actually accept yourself, it's going to be very tricky for other people to accept you because other people will treat you how you treat yourself, whether you like it or not. You, it is a you job. Like it's this, most of it is a you job. So the other people will just be there. Like you, you're going to be there feeling sad and sorry, and they're going to be feel, to feel sad and sorry with you. And then you will be like, but I don't want them to feel sad and sorry for me. But you, you, the energy you are giving is sad and sorry. So they're giving that back to you. <laughs> so the, the thing, because even when I'm with my friend, 99% of the time, I don't even think that they sit down and think like, oh, Doreen, have you taken treatment? They don't even remind me to take my treatment because they know, mm -hmm. like, sh we are not all about, oh, how are you feeling? Oh my God, this is, a lot of people complain to me that I don't want people to feel sad and sorry for me, but are you feeling sad and sorry for yourself? Because that is what people will give you. So if you give yourself love, if you accept yourself, if you take your treatment, nobody is even going to bother you that, oh, your feelings. And even when somebody says something mean, it will not bother you. Would you say that your experience and having to overcome all these things and learn all these things um, actually helped you to grow as a person, not just HIV, but in general? Yeah. It it did. Yeah. It it first of all helped me to live my best life, like be, like literally just live life to the fullest. Why? Because people expect HIV to be so life limiting, but it's not. It is you who gives it the power to limit you or not. Because if you you joke around with your adherence, it means that 
constantly you're going to be sick, which means that constantly you will not get to enjoy the life as it is. And sometimes people think that enjoying the life is more of like living large and grand. No, it's basically that waking up and being happy and not having that feeling of something weighing you down and now you're down the whole day, now you're stressed the whole time. No, it is just that feeling of happiness and you 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 just wake up and you just going around your day as a happy fulfilled person in life and it it did help me because now i started viewing life from a point of view of at one point the doctors actually sent me home to die and prepared my parents psychologically she is going to die so it is up to me to ensure that what was said about me, I do not prove it right. So I have to leave. I have to leave it up every day. <laughs> so to, it did help me to once I reached the acceptance stage. It actually did help me in viewing life in general from a very different perspective and from a very different angle. And the the actual part of getting over self stigma is the fact that now. It doesn't weigh you down. You don't feel some type of way. And I know a lot of people think that uh, overcoming self-stigma involves living publicly with HIV, but it's not about that. It's more about being able to tell a person, questioning you, what are those medications you're taking and telling them, oh, they're at risk, and you continue with your life as if nothing happened. Like, it's not a big deal. It's not a, it's not shocking news or breaking news. But... Um, what is it called? But when you have not yet accepted yourself, you will start feeling that everybody around you, you will start side eyeing everybody around you. Like even if they don't say anything, even if they make a joke about HIV, you're going to be like, yeah, that, that is targeting me. And probably it had nothing, nothing at all to do with you. So I know there is stigma in society in general, but also how you carry yourself will determine how society will carry you. Because, uh, I think one time my brother was uh, telling me, uh, he used to live in Botswana. So he was telling me how his friend just, uh, one time he was talking to his friend and his friend was like, and he was like, oh, I haven't seen you all morning. His friend was just like, I am just from the hospital to take my ARVs. And my brother was so shocked about how casual his friend was because in Kenya, we literally used to travel to another town where nobody knows you to pick your ARVs from there. So imagine we, when it's your clinic date, and you don't have transport money, it means you are skipping that clinic date. And, it, and it's not because there is no clinic near you. There is a clinic near you. But you can't go there because there people know oh. you. The nurse knows you. The, 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 the cleaning lady knows you. So you don't want to, to, to bump into somebody who knows you. And that is something we did for a long time, my mom and I. We will travel, like literally travel, two hours, three hours, just to pick ARVs or to pick septrin because we could not take ARVs from a town nearby. Because from the town nearby, people knew that we were, people would know that we were HIV positive. And still that did not stop people, the rumors. Because the rumors were there. The rumors were always there. And it's something I tell people that, don't stop worrying about what people will say. Because people will always have something to say. Even when you die, and because you stopped taking treatment or you never started treatment, they will still come to your funeral and they will still be there judging you for not taking treatment. So you better just take the treatment and stay alive. Like that is what I usually tell people. Take the treatment, stay alive. If they keep talking about you while you're alive, it is okay. But the, because it's, it's people's nature. But are you at peace with your status? Once you're at peace, once you reach that point, and it's not, it's not a one-day job acceptance is not a one day job it is an everyday job because you can i can also wake up tomorrow and i am overwhelmed and i don't want to accept that i'm HIV positive it can happen like that so it's a change in mentality that every day you wake up you're choosing to love life even if you're living with hiv which absolutely there is nothing wrong with it but people still have not yet reached where we would want them to see us as fellow human beings. But I always remind people who don't have HIV that remember you are you have a 50% chance of becoming HIV positive. So every time you're having unprotected sex with someone, that chance, your percentage keeps decreasing because you don't probably don't know their status, probably there's no protection being used. So stop laughing at people living with HIV because you can easily find yourself on the other side. Yeah, and for the person living with HIV, I think it's important 
uh, something that happens as you become an adult. For me personally, <laughs> it was a realization that other people, especially older people, adults, aren't necessarily right. Because I think yeah. as a child, you're taught like, okay, listen, listen to your elders, listen to adults. They yeah. know better. They're more educated. They've had more life experience. So I always just, I would assume that adults were right. That people around mm -hmm. me, if, 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 if a multiple of people or if the majority of people felt a certain way or thought a certain way, it was like, yeah. well, there must be something right to that. So if people are, you know, feeling negatively towards me, then they must have a, a valid reason. So yeah. I need to make, figure out what that is. But yeah. if, like you said, you have a sense of self, a sense of who you are, then you can stand there and say, even if I'm in a room with a hundred people and every single one of those persons looks negatively at me because I'm living with HIV, I know mm -hmm. that they are all wrong and I am yeah. the only right one. Yeah, true. So and it definitely takes a sense of self. It, it definitely is a sense of self. Like you, you have to reach that point where people's opinions don't get to you because especially now that I do social media advocacy where everybody has an opinion everybody has an opinion I have been told don't take your treatment publicly I have been told why do you share your status why can't you just live with it secretly like everybody else I have been told how many people have I infected with HIV I, I have been accused of uh, of um, lying to innocent men a lot of things have been said. So imagine if I let all of those comments every day, because it's every day. Imagine if I let them get at me and now I'm going to bed at night and I'm crying. I'm saying, oh, today this person accused me of infecting multiple people with HIV. You see, it's people. They were created to talk. So let them say whatever they have to say. I don't think that there's ever a way that you could behave or, or act or speak that would please everyone. There's always going to be someone who has something negative to say. It could be Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa <laughs> could be on social media and people would have negative things to say to her. <laughs> true, true, true. I agree <laughs> with you about that. Like, it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what you're doing. People, people will just always say something. That is why the most important person you have to work on is you. As long as you accept, as long as you, you want to live this life to the fullest, and you love life. Wake up, and I tell people every day, as you wake up today, wake up and choose to love life. And disclosure will happen. It's a process. It's not a one-day job. You don't have to tell everybody in your family that you are living with HIV. Because still, stigma can start in the family setup. So you don't have to tell everyone. Until you are ready to tell them, then don't tell them. Like, don't give yourself so much pressure about who do I disclose to? Who do I not tell? Where do I go? Can I find a partner? Yes, you can find a partner. Like, my parents were a whole discordant couple. So trust me, you can always find a partner. And he does not, he or she or they or them, they don't have to be HIV negative. Uh, sorry, HIV positive like you. Sometimes they can be HIV negative. And how do you tell them? Again, I tell people, tell, tell the person you are with when it is right by you. But don't put them at any risk knowingly that you're going to tell them at one point. So just say it as early as possible. Because I've been left for just telling people that I'm HIV positive. I have been left along the way and I was told, I'll talk to you, I'll, I'll give you a call. And he never called me back. So rejection will happen. And at least, and sometimes I joke about it and tell people, uh, at least you've been left with a reason and they said they left you because you're HIV positive. There are people who, the HIV negative people are left with, it's not you, it's me. And that is not even a reason. So just <laughs> like, you know, so don't, um, don't always put the burden of life or rather whatever goes wrong in your life on your HIV status. Your HIV status is a tiny part of your life and there is so much more about life that you can explore and work on that has nothing to do with living with HIV. So living with HIV is a tiny part of your life. The rest of the other parts that you work, you have to work with, work with that. But don't, don't all, it's not a personality that you're on a first date and you're thinking, how do I tell them? Do I go home? Do I ask? Do... No, I usually tell people your first date is for eating things you don't eat at home. That is not for disclosing. You will disclose <laughs> on the second date. Do not disclose on the first date. It's a bad idea. <laughs> eat, eat the things you don't eat at home. But 
ideally like relationships and HIV, it's, it's a thing it's it, it worries a lot of people but you again that sense of self has to make you reach a point and say whatever happens with this partner it's fine if they're not mine they're not mine because you you could probably have been HIV negative and they will still have rejected you so rejection happens to every human being don't put it around that you can have children you can yeah. live the life you want to live your HIV status is not a limiting factor to that. So I wish that one day, because recently I was asked a question that in a perfect world, uh, removing the HIV cure now, in a perfect world, what would I want to see from in the HIV response? And I say that I would love to see a world with no stigma, a world that has so much love to give that we are not looked upon like some, like we're not side-eyed for living with HIV. That, that would be my perfect world. Like That would be my wish that there is so much love from people around the world that they look at their friends, at their relatives, at their partners, and they don't see the HIV. They don't see the virus. They just see the person, the person they're related to, the person they love, and it's not limiting to them. And for the person living with HIV to look at themselves and they see Doreen, and not the virus. Like when I look at myself in the mirror, I don't see the virus. I just see the room, but I wish for everyone to reach that point. Okay, very, very well said. You are a very proficient, elegant, and funny speaker. So thank you for that. Thank you for driving this conversation. I barely yeah. had to do anything. I just sat back and let you take the wheel. <laughs> Um, but we're coming up on our time today. Um, I, I took so many notes and I have, mm -hmm. there's so much more that I would love to talk to you about. So I definitely want to bring you back on. And I'm, I have a feeling that my audience is going to just adore you and love everything that you had to say. So Please bring like, me I want to talk about, yes, I want to talk about, I would like to go more in depth into dating and disclosure mm -hmm. and herbal medicines and dealing with that as well. And, and, yeah. and, and your thoughts about cure and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So there's, there's a lot more to touch base on. Thank you again for, for coming on today. It's been a pleasure. Oh, before we go, uh, mm -hmm. how can people follow you and or your work? Uh, so on social media, across all channels. So I am on Facebook as Doreen Mora Moracha. It's a verified account. So yeah, uh, I'm on Instagram again, Doreen underscore Mora underscore Moracha. On Twitter, I am at D, a single D underscore Mora. Uh, on uh, LinkedIn, I'm Doreen Moracha. On uh, YouTube, Doreen Mora Moracha, and on um, on TikTok, uh, Doreen Mora Moracha as well. So that that is me, uh, and all I talk about is okay. HIV. <laughs> so, and yeah. I will put I will put links to all of those in the description box below this video, uh, so people okay. can easily find okay. that. Another thing I want to talk about is your uh, latest endeavor into formal education and training in the space too. Mm -hmm. I think. That's something that, that would be really enlightening. And I would love to get your insights and as you learn things to, to come on and talk about that. And especially women in HIV too. Okay. <laughs> See, I could just go on a tangent with you. <laughs> so bring me back again. Bring me back again. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's going to happen. Doreen, okay. a huge thank you to you for being so gracious with your time and ex expertise and your experience. Okay. Everyone mm -hmm. at home, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already and hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And please share this with anyone who might find value in this content. That is the best way that you can support me and my channel. Until next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.